This is Journey to Chinese Fluency podcast, episode number eighteen. Embarrassing moment, culture insights, proven methods to achieve Chinese fluency. Skip that learning curve with the Journey to Chinese Fluency podcast. Now, your host, Victor Yang. Hello, everyone. Victor Yang here, and welcome to Journey to Chinese Fluency. Today, I am joined by Jonathan Cosreed. Jonathan is an American film and television actor based in China. Jonathan was born in Torrance, California, in 1973. He attended the film and acting schools of New York University, but completed his university career there studying molecular biology. Jonathan began studying Mandarin Chinese. At New York University, and relocated to China in 1997, and started his acting career two years later. Here is one interesting fact about Jonathan: he is an actor, and he always plays white guys in Chinese movie. 你好 ，Jonathan. Welcome to the show. Are you ready to share with us your journey to Chinese fluency? Yes, I am. Awesome. So let's do that. So first of all, please feel free to fill in the blank a bit for the introduction. Well, I mean that was a pretty good introduction of me. I'm I'm a white guy who plays who plays white guys in Chinese movies. I, I've lived in China for almost <laughs> a year, pretty much my whole adult life. I graduated from university and then went straight over. And like most people who go to China, I was an English teacher for the first two years. One of the burger flippers of globalization. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's me. But you know, learning Chinese was was an interesting and, and fulfilling part of my life. So go ahead and ask me whatever questions you want to ask. Sure. So please first share with our listeners why you learn Chinese. Well, at, at NYU, at New York University, we were required to、uh, study one year of a foreign language, which actually made me really angry because at the time I thought, you know, ah, that's so racist against us Americans. You know, everybody speaks English. Why should I learn a foreign language? But you know, the university said, "Fine, you don't you don't have to study a foreign language, but you also don't have to graduate." So, <laughs> yeah. So I put it off and put it off until the the last year of college, and 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 honestly, I was irritated because I didn't want to I didn't want to study Spanish or German or French or something like that because you know everybody learns those languages and especially、mm-hmm. Spanish. They're Well, for you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people for whom that is, you know, they speak English and Spanish at at native lang level, just you know, just because they grew up that way. So, I was irritated, and and I remember the night before I had to choose a language, and I, I was flipping through the booklet and angrily, and, and then there it was Chinese, and and I thought, wow, that would be really cool. I, I I had this vision of myself suddenly going off and living in in this strange country and. Understanding the language and and understanding the culture and how everything worked and and that was really attractive. I thought that would be a a fun way to spend a part of my life. I didn't expect to spend most of my life, you、mm-hmm. know, the next years there. But but it just did. There was an a an attractive quality about being that guy. So so I signed up for Chinese classes, and it was actually really difficult when I when I first started. I mean, I remember my first day of Chinese classes. You, you know, a few weeks later and. I, you know, I, f- I found the room where the where you know beginning Chinese A B C Chinese was, and I and I went in, and it was it was all Chinese people in、mm. this class of beginning Chinese, which I thought was a little weird. I thought it was in the wrong room, and you know, I asked, <laughs> is this is this beginning Chinese? And and one guy in bad English with a strong Chinese accent said, you know, <laughs> yes, it is. And <laughs> so I ended up being the stupidest guy in that class because basically everybody else in the class could speak Chinese. I mean, there were there were like there were three kinds of kids in the class. There was、uh, you know kids from Taiwan who could、mm-hmm. speak, but they'd grown up in the United States, so they couldn't write very well. And then there were kids from like Hong Kong who、right. who could write, but they only spoke Cantonese. Their Mandarin was really bad. I, and then the third type of kid, they were like you know from from Shanghai or Beijing or wherever, getting an MBA, and they just wanted to bulk up their GPA, study their native language, which was really frustrating. And then there was stupid little me, you know, who who like <laughs> couldn't even say ni hao at the time. Yeah. So the class was really brutal. It was super super hard、uh, because you know the teacher, even though I was at the correct level for that class,、mm-hmm. uh, you know everybody else, the teacher couldn't slow down the class just for stupid old me, right? So it was really hard. <laughs> you know, I was taking some pretty difficult classes at the time. So when it came time to take the final exam, I, you know, I knew I was going to fail. <laughs> 
but I also knew that I was going to go, I was going to go to China. You know, like my plan was to go to China for a few years after I graduated. So I went to the teacher and I said, I said, you know, Mr. Professor Hula, I, uh, you and I both know that I'm going to fail this exam. And he said, what do you want me to do? I said, well, Professor Hua, I, I think that you have to ask yourself a question, which is what is your goal, you know, in, in becoming a teacher? Is your goal to, to test me and see if I've learned the language or is your goal to, to cause me to learn Chinese? I said, you know, if your goal is to test me, fine. You know, you test me tomorrow and I'll fail and that'll be the end of it. Success. But if your goal is to cause me to learn Chinese, you and I both know that I already have tickets to go to Beijing, to go to China. And if you fail me, which you have every right to do because I'm going to fail the test, I, I won't graduate and I won't go to China and I won't learn the language. I won't learn Chinese. However, if you pass me, no matter how low the grade is, I will pass. I, I will graduate from university. And, you know, the next thing I will do is go to China because, you know, I, you have seen my ticket already. And so he said, well, take the test first. And so I took the test and I got it was like 100 questions. And I got, you know, two, maybe three of them right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's pretty but brutal. Is, is, yeah. But he passed me, you know, with the lowest grade possible. Uh, you know, I got like a D plus on the test, which is passing grade. So I graduated and, and I was in China a few weeks later. So why did you want to go to China? Well, just, you know, because it seemed fascinating. I, you know, I mean, it was a two part thing, right? Number one, it just seemed, like I said, fascinating to be that guy, to go mm -hmm. over and do that strange thing and, and learn the language and, and, you know, become one of those guys who understands how things work in the foreign country, you know, to live a life like a character in a novel. The other reason, which I mean, I, my, my guess is that many of your listeners are going to be university students. And so they will they will pretty soon, you know, encounter the same problem that I faced when I was graduating, which is, you know, I've. I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. You know, there I was, whatever, 22, 23, and, and I just had no idea what I was going to do. And so to go off to a foreign country for a couple of years, two, three years, uh, learn the language, be cool, have an adventure, that seemed like a good, a good way to figure out an answer to that question. Mm. And I didn't want to go somewhere again. I, you know, I, I had already learned some Chinese. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go to Europe because that was like... You know, so so 50 years ago, I didn't want to want to go to Japan because that was like so 80s. So, you know, the exciting place seemed to be China. Honestly, I have to thank NYU because I really I would not have studied a foreign language. And in fact, I thought I was bad at foreign language mm -hmm. until they forced me to study one. And, and then I, I, I realized that I had a facility, you know, a natural talent at, at learning languages. Not only did I have a natural talent, but I thought it was fun. Mm -hmm. um, the whole the process of of listening to other people's gibberish and then figuring out the rules and then, and then turning that gibberish into meaning. Uh, you know, I, I, that's, that's still fun for me. Actually, you know, I'm, I'm 44 and I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning Spanish now. So anyway, we're a little late for learning Spanish, but there you go. Awesome. So what was your level of Chinese when you traveled to China? It was pretty low. I, I, I could tell you funny things I said, that you would laugh at, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't seem funny to your audience, you know, because, you know, it, I mean, for one, Chinese is tonal, right? So mm -hmm. you can make all kinds of terrible mistakes. Like, you know, you, you want to see, I'm, you want to say I'm concerned, right? I'm worried. I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. You want to say, what do you, right? Yep. <laughs> but you get the wrong tones. And so, so instead of saying, what do you, you say, what do you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Uh, and you know, and you know what that means, right? And yes. it's funny. You may not want me to repeat yes. it on your show. Uh, but it's better to explain to the audience what that means. I, I think. <laughs> yeah. So it, uh, what Zhao Ji means, I'm concerned. What Zhao Ji means, I'm looking for a prostitute. <laughs> yep. And you know, I made all kinds of you know what Zhao Ji, what Zhao Ji. They sound pretty similar when you just start studying Chinese. And you know, yes. I made I made all kinds of funny mistakes like that. Uh, like another mis funny mistake I made, which you'll laugh at, but again, won't make any sense to, to the members of your audience who don't speak Chinese. Is I went over, it, do you, you, you've been to Beijing, right? Yes, I'm from Beijing. Okay. Are you from Beijing? Yes. Uh, uh, Lao Xiang. Yeah, <laughs> Lao Xiang. 
<laughs> so you know, like you know, in the nineties, right? All the doors had those. Uh, they had like the there was the iron outer door, right? Yes. Yeah. And so the one time I I, I did not say I didn't know how to say it, right? I didn't know how to say it to him. And so one, one time I was knocking on my friend's door. I was like, and he wouldn't get up. He was asleep. And I was bang, 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 bang. And and he and and I was yelling, Xiao Pang, Xiao Pang, Xi Tuang. <laughs> get up. And and finally I bang, bang, bang. I said, Xiao Pang, uh, 打开你的高门. <laughs> oh man, that's a funny one. <laughs> You know, you uh, when you speak badly, you make all kinds of mistakes. And, for, and again, for the members of the audience who don't know what that means, uh, gong means steel and men means door. So I, I was trying to say open the steel door, but but gong men when you put them together means anus. <laughs> oh Which, man, I can't stop laughing on that one. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> yeah. So. I, you know, and I made hundreds of mistakes like that. But my Chinese was really bad. But one thing I did that was really useful, and, and probably the thing I did that was the most useful, and is the reason that I speak Chinese as well as I do, or is probably the reason I speak Chinese at all, let alone as well as I do, is because I, when I was on the plane over, I, I made a pact with myself, and that pact was I was going to speak only Chinese for the first mm. four months. That I was in Beijing, yeah, and it was hard. You know, uh, it was hard, and it was hard on a couple levels, right? I mean, number one, mm -hmm. it was just, it was, you know, logistically difficult because I spoke Chinese really badly, and and you know, to just ordering food and finding a bathroom was difficult. Mm. But it was also lonely. Any of yes. your audience who, who plans on you know going to China, and and if they they want to be fluent. If you're only speaking a foreign language, you go to a new country, you're having new experiences, it's, it's this big, incredibly exciting adventure in your life, and you're learning new things, and your eyes are opening up to the world, and you want to talk about it, like you do. I mean, it's, you know, you, know you, like you, you have a new experience, you talk to your buddy about it, right? Mm. But my Chinese was so bad that I just, like, I literally couldn't get the words out of my mouth because I didn't know how to say them. And so all of this stuff, this ferment that was occurring in my mind, I, I couldn't talk about it. So it was sort of, it was locked up in my head, which is pretty lonely, but also uh, very motivating in, in making me want to learn how to, to talk. But, and third, and this was weird, this I didn't expect. Um, when you, when you go to a foreign country and you start to speak their language, you'll mm. speak it back. You sound like a child and people will treat you like you're stupid. Be, not because you are, but because you you talk like a stupid person, you know. Because in general, people just judge, they judge you based on how you talk. Uh, mm. And if you talk like a five year old, people treat you like a five year old. I mean, even though if you press them and you said, "Well, you know, do you think he's actually stupid or or just like speaks the language badly?" They would probably say he's not stupid. He just speaks the language badly. But they but still unconsciously they they treat you like an idiot. And mm. so I, I wasn't used to that. Um, but again, it was it was very motivating um, to force me to to learn. And but anyways, what happened was I ended up living with a Chinese buddy. Like I made a buddy there, you know, and and we got, you know, we became roommates, and and that was really useful because I because then just the everyday give and take about you know like you know normal guy stuff like talking about women, mm -hmm. uh, planning stuff. It was you know we had to do it all in Chinese, which. Just so it became sort of just the everyday language of my my normal life pretty quickly, and even though I spoke it badly, I improved rapidly uh, because mm -hmm. you know I met some new girl and I wanted to talk to my buddy about it, and and we did, and then so I improved you know that that you know my level of Chinese improved right. rapidly. That was helpful. It was really helpful on two levels. Okay, number one, it was just helpful in a practical way. Like it forced me to learn a lot of Chinese. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it was helpful on another, probably more important level, which is that the worst thing that a person can do if they go to a foreign country to learn a language, say China, if they go to China to learn Chinese, the very worst thing that you can do is go take a Chinese class. Mm. It will guarantee that you never learn the language. And the reason is because the only place in all of China where there are no Chinese people 
is in a Chinese class. You know, it's all other foreigners. Not only is it all other foreigners, but it's all other foreigners who are super similar to you. You know, That's true. they left home country. They are on an adventure. They are taking the road less traveled, blah, 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 right? So it's really easy to become really good friends with them because they're so much like you and they share so much of your worldview and life experience. And any one person can only have so many friends. And once your friend calendar gets filled up with people who speak your native language, then you don't have any room for like your local life, your Chinese life. And people who do that end up not making any Chinese friends or they make friends with Chinese people who speak English. And those people never learn Chinese. I have never met, not once in 20 years. And, you know, mm. maybe, maybe one of your listeners is an exception in the future. But I, in 20 years of living in China, I've never met someone who went and took classes and then learned the language. Mm. That's very true. For my experience, I'm a Chinese. I lived in Melbourne, Australia, and I learned my Chinese here. I mean, I learned my English here, and I do see a lot of Chinese traveling to Western countries, and, you know, there's a lot of Chinese outside. So it's so easy to make friends with Chinese rather than make friends with English-speaking people. So that's what happens. You know, a lot of Chinese can't learn English properly because they always hang out with Chinese. Exactly. Chinese go to Australia and Jadwar, and, and ex, you know, expats go to, to China and Jadwar, and, and then they... You know, they don't venture out into the into the wider country and, and they don't learn the language. Just let me clear the word jadwar with uh, our audience. It basically means gathering together, you know, basically you know, a group of people just being together. Well, jadwar means it means like to to like stick with your own crowd, yes. you know, to the exclusion of, of, of everyone else. And so, you know, that's, that's what right. Chinese do. When they go anywhere. They make their own little Chinatown and jadwar and, and foreigners do the same thing in, in Beijing. And mm -hmm. I mean, in all of China. Yeah. Anyway, if you don't learn the language in the first year you'll, you're there, you never will. Mm. Because after that, your life kind of settles into a routine. It's only in that first year where life is chaotic and, and in flux enough and you're, you're reformatting, reformulating your life that you have an opportunity to learn the foreign language, you know, in China or, or in whatever other country you're going to go to if you go mm. to a foreign country after you graduate. Because after that first year, you, you've, you've sort of settled into an identity in that foreign society. And, and, you know, learning a language after that is so hard because your identity, and I'm going to use a word here. I'm going to use one curse word, okay? You just have to deal with it. <laughs> your, your identity for the first year that, that you're in a foreign country has to be shabi. <laughs> yeah, you, but it, you have to be a stupid idiot the first year that you are in a foreign country. You have to be that stupid guy who says everything wrong, struggles over his words, the irritating guy, the guy who insists on speaking the language that he doesn't speak well, even when other people speak his language. Because if you don't, you'll never learn it. It's, it's really simple. That's a great point. Make mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. That's how you learn. Don't be afraid to be a shabby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, that's true. So, like, we'd like to know a bit more about your method in learning Chinese. So what's been the most effective technique or method that's been working for you? So you mentioned that you've been hanging out with your roommate, who is a native Chinese. Is there any other ways, any other methods you've been using to learn your Chinese? For example, in terms of yeah. you know, listening, speaking, reading, and writing? Yeah, I'll tell you how, how I learned Chinese. I mean, other than just, like, you know, going out with women, talking to my buddies, <laughs> uh, I had a tutor. Right. Every day. I, I, I paid a tutor to come talk to me for an hour a day. Mm. And I, I just basically I paid my tutor to listen to me talk about my day. Because when you like if, if when you first get to China or, you know, any foreign country, but just say China. Right. When you first get to China and you want to say today, this morning, I was hungry when I woke up, uh, but I didn't know where a restaurant was and so I went downstairs and I got a cab and I told him to take me somewhere where there was good food and he uh, and he did right when you mm. first arrive that's difficult to say and so if you just try to tell your tutor that and you know you're going to encounter 20 words that you don't know how to say and your tutor will tell you how to say them and but the important thing is the next day you tell your tutor about your day again the next day you tell your tutor about your day again and the point the point being okay 
you're going to use the same words over and over again because they come from your normal life. And, and the words mm. that everybody needs are different. You know, the words that I need as an actor are different from the words you need as a podcaster. You know, I have no idea how to say podcast in Chinese, but I can tell you how to say continuity error. Mm. That's very interesting. And the thing that makes you remember words is using them. Once you use a yes. word three times in a conversation, it's yours forever. Yes. But if you memorize it, you'll remember it maybe for a day, maybe two days. Mm. At best, you'll remember it until the test. But after the test, you'll forget it if you don't use it in a conversation three times, in three That's different true. conversations. Um, and so what happens is in, when you're learning a language in a, in a school, right, the, the, the school book or the teacher will make you memorize words. You know, like you memorize peach, apple, pear, banana, plum, cherry, grape, right? Mm. And if you're good at memorizing, you'll, you'll remember them, but you'll forget them pretty quickly. Not only that, but it's boring. But if you, if you just tell your tutor about your day, which is what I did for a year, basically, um, you'll use words that come from your life. You will use them not only the next day when you're talking to your tutor, but you'll use them just in every, your everyday life because precisely because they come from your everyday life. And it's not boring because mm. you, you get to talk about real normal stuff with your tutor. And, and not only that, Chinese is, is just for this method, okay, Chinese is extremely suitable. And the reason is Chinese vocabulary is hard, but the grammar is easy. If you take a language like, you know, like German or French where, where the, or, or Russian where the grammar is pretty difficult, you actually have to spend some time outside of conversation just learning the structure of the grammar because, you know, with all the conjugations and the tenses and stuff, it's just difficult and there's a structure to it. But Chinese grammar is, is super easy. There's no tense. There's no conjugation. There's no gender. I go, he go, she go, we go tomorrow, yesterday, you know in the past. So the only hurdle for Chinese is the vocabulary and the pronunciation, both of which are super difficult because mm. there bas there's basically no cognates in Chinese. I mean, Spanish, you know, it's like 60% cognates. Chinese, there's like eight words, you know, hamburger, hambabal, sofa, shafa, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. That, I mean, in like, eight, you know, 10 more maybe. That's it. Yeah. Um, and because it's tonal, the pronunciation is really difficult. But that's what just talking to someone helps with is grammar and pronunciation. And, and honestly, when people ask me how to, how to study Chinese, that's what I tell them. And I think that I, have sh I should have some cred, right? Because I speak pretty good Chinese. But mm. that's the response that I always get, your response, which is, hmm, uh, I speak Chinese really well, and I learned it that way. And I know that's a good way to learn it. And I know that if people would try to learn it that way, they would learn it better than they do. Every time people ask and I tell them, that's your response is exactly the response that I get. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just really curious how you learned your pronunciation because your pronunciation is really good. I'm sure you must be like doing a lot of practice on that. Otherwise, how did you achieve near native pronunciation? Uh, it's probably a combination of two things. I cared about it a lot. Like I, it's, I enjoy the process of, of copying people and sounding how they sound. But also the reality is there's genetic luck involved in that. <laughs> No, it's just reality. Some people are good at learning accents and other people are not. And it's like, I mean, it's like being pretty, right? Some people are born pretty, some people are not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can, you can put on some makeup and you can go from a six to a 7.5 or an eight, but you can't go from a four to a 10. Mm. So apart from Mandarin Chinese, do you speak any other foreign languages? Nope, just Chinese. I'm learning Spanish now because I'm, I'm moving to Spain. Right. Interesting. So you've basically been just practicing with native Chinese. And... Yeah, I mean, my, my, you know, I work on Chinese movie sets, right? And so there's not a lot of time to screw around. So I have to, my, I mean, my Chinese, my fluency has to be perfect, basically. Mm. Uh, they don't have time to explain things to me. Yeah. Not to say that I speak Chinese perfectly. I mean, I speak English better than I speak Chinese, and, and I don't speak Chinese. Like, you never, ever speak a foreign language at a totally native level, right? Mm -hmm. But I speak it pretty well. So did you spend a lot of time practicing apart from just you know having a tutor and talking to your roommate? No, and that's the point. I didn't have to spend a lot of time practicing because my whole day was naturally practicing. Mm. My whole day, every day was naturally practicing. And that's kind of the point. People are lazy, right? And mm. everybody has this experience. Like, you know, you study really hard the first day. You study even harder the second day. And you're so proud of yourself. Oh, my God, I'm such a hard worker. 
and you say on the third day, wow, I'm such a hard worker. I deserve a break. And that's the end of it. But mm. and, and so the point, the, the you know, the recipe for success when you're studying something is to find a way that you'll learn it anyway, even if you're e- e- even assuming you're lazy. And so that was why I organized my life that way so that I wouldn't have to ever make a decision like, am I going to study today? Because after a few days, of course, the answer is going to be no. Mm, that's true. I think that's a very good method. So apart from your method in learning Chinese, what has been your biggest challenge in learning Chinese and how did you overcome it? My biggest challenge in learning Chinese, I found it really difficult to learn how to write because, um, you know, there's, the, I mean, there's very little phonetic connection between characters and, and, uh, and speaking. Mm-hmm. And so I, I didn't have a good method of conversation that it would allow me to just kind of naturally and organically learn how to write and read in the same way that I learned how to speak. So what I did, so for a long time, I basically couldn't read. But then when smartphones came into existence uh, and you could, you know, type in pinyin and the and the characters would come out. Then I learned how to read and write pretty quickly from sending messages back and forth to people. But it was mm-hmm. a real it was it was a real problem. Kind of basically for the first I don't know for the first I'd say for the first seven years that I was in China, reading and writing was a real problem for me. But then after phones that could uh, where you you know that had QWERTY keyboards on them, then I learned how to read and write pretty quickly. You know over the over the course of about a year and a half maybe. Right. So I guess your method of learning Chinese is really kind of passive. Um, you kind of put yourself into the environment and let the environment direct how you're going to learn the language. Exactly. Since the, since the environment determines what, what I'm going to need, I might as well allow the vir- environment to teach me the Chinese that I will need uh, in my everyday life. Cool. So if you were to start learning Chinese from scratch all over again, how would you do it? The same. Awesome. So now please... Tell us a success story, a most rewarding moment after you have became fluent in Chinese. The most rewarding moment after I became fluent in Chinese. <laughs> Probably, I mean, there were a lot, you know, but one of the most, mm-hmm. I'll tell you one rewarding moment and one funny moment. Sure. Uh, the rewarding moment, I was, uh, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but somehow I was on a talk show. And at that point, my Chinese was pretty good, and there were not a lot of foreigners who spoke good Chinese. So it was still, you know, like, oh, ha, ha, look at the funny foreigner who speaks good Chinese. And, like, with a, with a really strong Beijing accent. Right. Uh, and, and, and so then a couple weeks later, they wanted me to come, and, and this is teacher, you know. They wanted me to come and do a, a thing for them on, on their program, like host a little segment. And it was kind of like, oh, see – see Beijing afresh through a foreigner's eyes. But that was kind of boring. So it mm-hmm. degenerated quickly into like watch Cao Cao run around making people do stupid stuff. But anyways, I, basically, I, I didn't understand at the beginning what a big deal it was. I thought it was just some dumb show, like the other dumb shows that I'd done before. So I did it, and, and, and because I thought it was dumb, I wasn't nervous. And, and I, you know, I did it, we did a couple shows, and then they started a broadcast, and... I still remember with great clarity the day after the first of those shows broadcast, I went to get, I went out to eat kao yu, and some random guy in the restaurant was like, yo, cao cao. And I was like, hey, <laughs> what's up? I, I haven't seen you in a long time. Because I had no idea who he was, but I, I was embarrassed. So I pretended to know him. Right. And I pretended to remember him. And, and he looked at me really weird. And he was like, no, no, I, we don't know each other. I just know you from TV. <laughs> What is the name of the show again? Dichir. Dichir, right. Which at the time was a big show. It's canceled now, but um, with Yuan Yuan. Yuan Yuan. Anyway, so it was, it was really cool to, to, have in a, to, be, to be publicly recognized for speaking Chinese well. To be on TV, to, to speak it well enough to be on TV and have people watch it and say, man, your, your Chinese is great. Uh, I took a, a kind of narcissistic pleasure in that. Mm-hmm. And that show ran for about three years, and, and it, we, like, it was really popular when it was on. It got canceled later, but, but it was, while we did it, it was super fun. The, uh, and, and people still remember it. I mean, that show went off the air like 10 years ago, and people still, uh, nine years ago, and people still remember. Uh, so here's the funny story. 
I was in San Francisco and I got into an elevator with my wife. It was our anniversary. My, my, my wife is Chinese. And we were going up at the top of the mark or something, some, some, some fancy uh, cocktail bar in San Francisco. And we got in the elevator and following us into the elevator was this old white guy and this really hot young girl, also a white girl. But, you know, the guy was like 60 plus and she was she was really young and really pretty. And, you know, it's nice when things like this happen or in any because my wife and I have a secret language in America, which is Chinese. Right. And we were, mm -hmm. you know, we were reasonably sure usually that people don't speak our secret language. Yeah. And so shame on me. OK, to my great discredit, I started to make fun of the old guy in Chinese. Make fun of him and his, uh, you know, young date who was like less than half his age, you know, maybe maybe a third his age. <laughs> and oh, my God, I can't repeat on your show what I said, but it was so mean. <laughs> um, I mean, it was basically like the super vulgar version of, oh, look at this lecherous old man and his um, his young woman of loose morals. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the super disgusting, vulgar version of that in Chinese. Right. And so this old white guy and his young white girlfriend got off the, the elevator at the, at the cocktail bar and we went and sat down. And about 10 minutes later, this dude, this 60 plus year old dude walked over and in perfect Chinese, I mean, better than mine, <laughs> walked over to me leaned in and said, hi, how you doing? Um, I was just wondering, you know, if you knew anything about this bar, the history of it is pretty interesting. Would you like me to tell you? And <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, he shut me up. I was so stunned and embarrassed. And he was cool about it. He didn't say a thing about what we said in the elevator. He just like chilled out, talked to me. He was like, oh, your Chinese is, you know, it's pretty good. How long you live there? Um, cool. Great. Awesome. And he was, he was the nicest guy, but man, right. did he sit down hard. Wow. That's quite an experience. Yeah. So from the first, I learned how to be proud that I spoke Chinese well. From the second, I learned how to not be too proud. Yes. Yes. How would you compare your life before you've learned Chinese and your life after you have learned Chinese? That's a tough question to answer, in part because my life after I learned Chinese is my life in China, right? And so it's those two things are inextricably intertwined. And so... I mean, my life after I lived, after I learned Chinese was I was living in a foreign country, having an exciting life. Uh, and a big chunk of that was a direct result of learning Chinese really well. Mm. Cool. So now please share one special thing about the Chinese culture that is different to your own culture. I, I am not of the opinion that Chinese culture is that much different from American culture, honestly. People make a big deal about like, oh, cultural differences, cultural differences. But for the most part, people want the same things. Now, in public, in, a, in, a, in different countries, people may do and say different things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just because of, I mean, you know, people say, oh, China's a little bit conservative. China's a little bit conservative in public. But people say, oh, you know, Americans are so brash and, and loud and Australians too, presumably. But Australians are brash and loud in public. And Americans are too. But in private, people settle down into just being normal people. And for the most part, you know, Chinese people, Spanish people, French people, Australian people, American people are pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not so much that I learned about what's different between the United States and China. It's more that I learned how much is the same. So while you're with your girlfriend, do you find anything that's culturally different? Not really. Right. You know, here's the thing. I get asked this a lot on talk shows, right? They, they're like, oh, my God, you're married with a Chinese. You must have so many cultural differences and so many problems. <laughs> and it's kind of a stupid question, honestly, as if as if we're like automatons walking around, you know, slaves to our culture. Most people are who they are, regardless of where they are. Their their own personality weighs much heavier on their actions than, you know, does like where they grew up. I mean, it's a combination, but, but, you know, people's personality shines through always. Sure. People's personalities shine through always. Um, and, I mean, the classic example, the, the stupid example that talk show hosts love to use is Zuo Yuezhe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's called the moon, now, isn't it? I mean, you know, in China, women are supposed to stay inside and not take a bath 
for a month after they have a baby. Yep. And we don't do that in America, right? Mm. You know, we have our own superstitions. China has their own superstitions. Now, what to do? Now, number one, not every Chinese wants to do yuezhe. A lot of Chinese people say, yeah, I, you know, I don't really want to do that. Maybe I'll do it for a couple of days, but, but not more than that. You know, some do, some don't. Number two, just say my wife or especially my mother-in-law wanted my wife to do yuezhe. You know, stay inside for a month after she gave birth. Mm. Now, if she came to ask me now, so how is that problem solved? Now, according to talk show hosts, right? Like my mother, this should cause a huge problem. My mother-in-law and my my wife, no, we are Chinese and this is our culture. We must do yuezhe. And me as an American, <laughs> you know, I would get incensed by this this ridiculousness, and I would say, no, it is not logical and, and not according to science. And you know, you cannot do yuezhe, <laughs> right? All that stupid stuff. But that's, I mean, that's not really how people solve problems. You know, in the real non-talk show world, you know, my wife comes to me and she says, you know, hon, I don't really want to do it, but it's important to my mom. What do you think? And I say, well, you know, if it's important to your mom, you know, that that's fine. Um, you're going to do it for the whole month? Yeah, maybe not. Maybe just a couple weeks to make my mom happy. Um, I kind of wanted to do it too because I feel like I should. Okay, right? Like you solve it like rational, normal human beings. And pretty much every, you know, cultural difference problem can be solved in that way as long as you act like a rational human being and not an idiot. Mm. What's your favorite city in China? Is it Beijing? Oh, Beijing by far, yeah. In part, just because I, I like the physical infrastructure of Beijing, I, I would say Shanghai is a close second in terms of just the city itself, because mm -hmm. both Shanghai and Beijing are really nice cities. Um, Shanghai, the physical infrastructure of Shanghai may even be, be nicer because um, Shanghai is a really nice city. But the, the thing that I like more about Beijing uh, is the people. You know, China is, is a super migratory place, right? Like people from everywhere go to the big cities, including from overseas, you know, like me. But, but you know, people piao to Beijing and they piao to Shanghai and they, they piao to a variety of different places. And what I've noticed over time is that cities self-select the type of people who go to them. You know, mm -hmm. if you are a super ambitious person who wants to make as much money as he can in, you know, the the craziest place that he can find, then he will go to Shanghai. If 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 somebody it, it like w just wants to escape from the world and and hang out all day and have no responsibilities, he'll go to Dali. <laughs> you know, if somebody wants to if Somebody is, is like, you know, a number obsessed business guy who, you know, wants to spend his entire life just accumulating wealth penny by penny. He'll go to Guangzhou. But for the most part, people who go to Beijing are different. Um, they want to make money. They're ambitious. But they also are interested in the world, not just the Chinese world, but, the, you know, the wider international world. They care more about art more about aesthetic things, and including foreigners. I mean, if you're a foreigner and you want to make money, you go to Shanghai. If you're a foreigner and you want to experience China, you're more likely to go to Beijing. I totally agree. That's definitely different characters between different cities in China. And you have summed it up pretty well. The Shanghai people used to be jerks. They've calmed down a lot, you know, because Shanghai used to be so much better than every other city in China. But, yes, yes. But the other cities of China have caught up. And so in the last, I'd say the last six, seven years, Shanghai people have like recognized that reality that, that Shanghai is no longer so much better than other cities in China. And Shanghai people mm. have chilled out a lot. Yeah, that's very interesting to point out because it does happen amongst Chinese. Shanghai people definitely have a bad reputation, I would say. Yeah, although Shanghai people are so, people are so prejudiced. Like... <laughs> I, I went to I was in Shanghai a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the it was really the air was really dirty in in uh, in Shanghai that day. And and I was talking to the cab driver, and I was like, oh, the wow, the air is is unusually dirty in Shanghai today. And he said, uh, sure, Bei Feng Lai <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Uh, the, he said he said yes, that's yes. There's a there's a wind from the north. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, yeah, that's typical Shanghai. <laughs> typical Shanghai. It was like so typical Shanghai. Yeah. Is there a tool, an app, or a website that you cannot live without in learning Chinese? No. No, you don't use any tool or app, any website, nothing. 
Uh, I have a dictionary that I use, but it's it's just for um, just for reading. The dictionary that I use is hold on a sec. I use KT Dictionary. KT Dictionary. Yeah, I mean it may not be the best one. It just happens to be the one that I use and am used to. Right? Is it a dictionary translating from Chinese to English? It goes. It's both ways. Right. The reason I like it is because、um, I can type in pinyin and it'll give me the characters, or I can copy paste. Say I don't say I get a text and I, there's a character there I don't know. I can copy paste it over and it'll give me the pinyin. Because like if I see the pinyin, then I I know what word it is because I know how to say it. I just may not know how to read it. So it's useful for me for that. It's it's it, it always has English,、uh, Chinese characters in pinyin. Right. Yeah, I found it. It's KT Dict. Yeah, KT Dict. And a lot of the Chinese dictionaries they don't have the the pinyin. If you, it might not have the pinyin. Some do, some don't. This one does. Like I said, it's、right. not it's not like it's the best program. It just happens to be the one that I'm used to. Okay. Cool. You still using it now? I am. Cool. So if you are to recommend to our listeners. One book in learning Chinese or the Chinese culture. What would that be? Well, for me, that's a simple question. Obviously, my name, right?、Uh, <laughs> my name is Cao Cao, and and Cao Cao is the main one of the main characters, the main bad guy in a in in a novel, an, an old Chinese novel called Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And、yes. I, I I was curious who Cao Cao was because I I'd encountered the name in other contexts, and so. And, I read the book and I realized, oh, he's he's this incredibly fascinating guy. the The book itself is is really useful to read, just in the way that it、uh, it allows you an understanding of how how Chinese people view the world, how they view themselves, and every character in that book is an archetype of、uh, like a, a a type of Chinese personality. You know, every culture is the same, but but there are different ways that different cultures. Sort of narrow that flow into you know different ways of dealing with the world and and the ways that you know Cao Cao and Liu Bei and Sun Quan and and Zhuge Liang and and Zhang Fei and and Guan Yu and all these people the way that they encounter the world and solve the problems that they encounter it's both it's both interesting and it's a good story but it's also but each of those characters really is an archetype of of one type of Chinese personality and and and. One way of successfully dealing with China. That's right. It's a very famous book. It's one of the four most famous、uh, novel written in Chinese history. So every Chinese knows that is Sun Guo Yan Yi. That's the Chinese name. Guo Yan Yi, exactly. And it has the advantage over the other books. I mean, you know, Hong Long Long, right? The the Dream of Red Mansions.、Mm-hmm. You will disagree with me, but that book is so boring. <laughs> And、um, Shui Hu, right?、Mm. Honestly, the book for kids. I enjoy reading it when right, I was young. <laughs> yeah, exactly.、Um, you know, so and and the, the thing, the nice thing about、um, oh, it's COG also. You know, I mean, it's a good book, right? But again, it's for kids.、Mm-hmm. And 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 the thing about Sangwa is it's a book for adults. You know, you can read as an、uh, you can read it as an adult and enjoy it、um, in a way that you know COG and 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 Shuihu you can't really because they're books that you read when you're seventeen. And, and and you know, Hong Mong is a book you read when you're like you know seventy two, and you're like, yeah, that was really you know, it's a good book.、Mm. Well, that's interesting insight because you know what, there is actually a Chinese saying, 少不看水浒，老不看三国 which means when you're young, you don't when you're young, you don't you don't watch 水浒 and when you're old, you don't read 三国 The reason being, right, if you read 水浒 which is you know all about fighting, you know, you know when you're、right. young. You are very passionate. You you aggressive. You know, if you're reading Shui Hu too much, that's probably bad for your character、right. to you know、and、build you up. Read some when you're old, you become too crafty.、Yeah. <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> so I、yeah. guess you know that explains why you mentioned that Sun Guo is more suitable for older people, even though you know it makes you more crafty, but it's probably more interesting for older generation to read it. Right. So now. Please teach our listeners your favorite Chinese quote, phrase, or expression. Well, I mean, your listeners probably already know that China has lots of little four-character, occasionally five-character,、um, little pithy sniper shots of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> um, and many of them are interesting. M- many of them are funny. And many of them are mean, so I'll, get, I'll I'll teach them a mean one. 
Okay. <laughs> one of the my one in part because you see this all the time, uh, and so so the my favorite one today is um, 骑驴找马。骑驴找马。我呃，骑驴找马。It's it literally translated means、um, riding a donkey looking for a horse,、mm-hmm. uh, and so it's used all the time, like we, especially when some some girl or some guy is dating somebody who isn't really at their level, like somebody slumming a little bit, <laughs> but while they're, they're just kind of slumming、uh, in a holding pattern until they meet somebody better. That's an interesting can, one. Yeah, you can use it in any situation、uh, where you're you're doing you're not in the situation yet that you want to be, and you know, or the person is not yet in the situation they want to be, and they're using somebody while they search for something better. It's the sort of thing that you learn from reading Sangua. Right. Well, that's interesting. You know, there's another quote which is 骑驴找驴 Have you heard of that one? No, I have not heard of that.、One. It's different to 骑驴找马 See, 骑驴找马 means you are riding a donkey and you're looking for a horse. You you know you're trying to reach to someone else level which you are not at, right? But 骑驴找驴 means you're riding a donkey and you're lo- you're searching for a donkey. It means you lost something. You can't find something. It's like oh, where's my phone? You know, I've been searching for my phone all around the house, but I just can't find it. And then look what's in your hand. Oh, you see my hand. You know, that's 骑驴找驴 Really, that's funny. I never heard that before. Yeah. Well, so now, if you are to give our listeners one single piece of advice in learning Chinese, what would that be? When you come to China, stay out of a classroom. Great advice. Just before we let you go, Jonathan,、mm-hmm. how can our listeners reach you? The well, actually, let me let me do two things. Okay, the 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 Chinese phrase that、uh, that I just taught you is it's useful, but there's another one that I actually, in terms of of learning Chinese and in terms of You know the you know the adventure that many of you are about to embark on, which is you know going to a foreign country and and living there and speaking that language、uh, is、um, is another piece of advice and and a, you know a less a less mean and crafty piece of advice and it's something that、uh, Kongzi that Confucius said, which is、um, if I'm walking with three people, one of them、uh, can teach me something.、Um, I forgot how to say it in Chinese. 三人行必有我师Oh, 对，三人行必有我师 Exactly, and that that's a really useful piece of advice. From I mean, if you really read Confucius, just like if you really read the New Testament or if you read the Quran, it it's full of really good, really practical advice, and and that's one of them. And、mm. if you keep that Confucius lesson in mind when you go to a foreign country and respect the local culture and and respect the you know the 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 accumulated wisdom of the culture, then you you will gain knowledge and perspective and insight、uh, from every interaction that you have with people there.、Mm. Now, how can people reach me?、Uh, mm. You know, just I don't know. Go on my. I'm easy to find on the internet. You know, just just、yes. Google my name. Go on my Facebook page. Add me on Facebook. I mean,、uh, you know, finding me is easy. Yes. Awesome. So thank you, Jonathan, so much for sharing with our listeners your journey to learning Chinese, and thank you so much for giving us so much background information on how to learn Chinese and being just passive, just being immersing yourself into the environment. That is just so valuable. Well, thanks for having me. To our listeners, the show note is now available at Chinese Talk Is dot com slash eighteen. Talk Is is spelled as T A L K E Z E. Do you want to learn Chinese for free? Start your own journey to Chinese fluency with my video lessons at ChineseTalkEase.com. TalkEase is spelled as T A L K E Z E. Also, remember to join our Facebook group. Just head over to TalkChineseCommunity.com. If you have enjoyed the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. Each month, I will choose one reviewer and give out a one-year subscription to all my premium video lessons for free. That's it for now. I'll see you in the next episode.